Sing praise to the Lord, you saints of his, and give thanks at the remembrance of his holy name. For his anger is but for a moment, his favor is for life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Please stand and join me in blessing God for his kindness toward us. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell with the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Uh, let me welcome you here. I just want to say a prayer over us all this morning as we get started. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit, I just pray that you would be with us in this place and in this room. Uh, would you bring our minds towards you and uh, with whatever humble offerings uh, that we have today, would each of us leave knowing that you're near us and you're with us and you walk with us. Let's all together pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thanks for being with us, y'all. Please stand and sing, Like a River Glorious. <laughs>
Let me pray for us as we collect our offering today. Heavenly Father, uh, we give ourselves to you just like you have given your son to us, and we just pray that uh, what we offer to you is meaningful and is used for your glory. Would you make our hearts generous and, uh, and provide for us so that we know that we can trust you. Help us to trust you entirely. We pray this in your name. Amen. The ushers can come forward with the offering plates. Hey, come. 
Y'all can be seated. Good morning. Mask on. You stuck with me. He's never coming back. It's just me from here on out. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Oh, good morning. I'm super glad that you're all here. Um, we've been going through a series on the Psalms and sort of picking up selections of Psalms, just sort of like putting them under the microscope and looking at like what their significance are, what the metaphors are, what their meaning for us are. Um, and I've really enjoyed both Matt and Steve, who's come to preach. But I want to start this morning a little reflectively. I want to start with a question for you guys, okay? It's this. Why are you here? Not why are you here and like the existential, like why are you here, what, what's the purpose of life, but like why are you here at church this morning? You don't have to answer audibly. Please don't, in fact. Thank you for your contribution in the back. But I'm going to give you just a few moment, moments to just sit in the quiet and ask yourself, consider seriously, why are you why are you here this morning? All right. Now I'm going to tell you the best reason why you should be here. The reason why you ought to be at church, okay? And it's this. It's to have an encounter with the living God. That's why you're here this morning. To have an encounter with the living God. Maybe some of you thought when we did that exercise, well, I come here week over week, every Sunday. I have for a long time. If you're coming out of a sense of obligation this morning, then there's nothing that I can offer you or that the Lord can do to move that will satisfy you because you've already been satisfied by sort of checking that mental box. Or some of you might be having a really great life, like my daughter Holly over there, and you're just so filled up, you're eager, you want something more. So you come to church and you're like, well, hopefully I can get something more, something to sustain this goodness that I'm feeling. You're eager for comfort. And that's a totally fine thing, but it's not the reason that we're here. And maybe some, of, some others are, of you are here because you're, you're at your wit's end. And you've tried everything that you can. You're kind of stuck. And you're looking for a way to be able to move out of the place that you're in. You need God. You need an encounter with God to meet you where you're at, to take up your cause, and to bring you to the other side of wherever you are. Amen. And that's a great reason to come to church. That's a great reason to give your attention to God, to let him guide you and show you the way. Not only that, it's the reason that we come to the Psalms, to have an encounter with the living God, to let him meet us and direct us. If we come to the Psalms with an attitude of obligation, we won't find God there, straight up. If you come looking only to be filled, to get a little pick-me-up, to feel good, you'll lose sight of why you're there. But if we come expectant or in need of God, he will meet us there. So the Psalms invite us into a place where we can have an honest encounter with God, but it's critical that we come to them correctly or we'll deaden their power entirely, just as it is the case when we come to church. So to that point, I want to offer you three questions that you should be considering when you sit down to engage with any given psalm before we even touch Psalm 23. These are written in your sermon notes uh, in your bulletin, so y you can see them there, but I encourage you to write them with your hand. The science says that when you write something down with your own hand, you're eight times more likely to remember it than if you just hear it. So I would encourage that. All right, question number one. When we come to a psalm, we ask ourselves, is this my current experience of life and God? Do we have some sort of paradigm to get ourselves attentive when we come to sit with the psalms to ask ourselves, is this psalm describing your lived experience, your current experience of God doesn't match your life now, today. For example, if you were to just sit down and you were to read, shout to joy for God, all the earth, sing the glory of his name, give him high praise from Psalm 66. You're just sitting there in the morning and you crack that open. But this week your girlfriend dumped you or your car got broken into or, or some awful thing like that. That psalm might not just it might just not hit you. It might just not resonate with your current experience of where you're at, right? But now consider same scenario. Your girlfriend dumped you or your car got broken into and you read Psalm 43, the first verse. Vindicate me, O God. Defend my cause against ungodly people. 
That might just hit you just right. You might be like, this is exactly, yes, God is on my side this morning. This resonates with me. This is in the place that I'm in. Now, there's a danger in absolute statements, but I would wager that no matter what circumstance your life is in right now, if you come to the Psalms, there is a Psalm that will meet you where you're at, that will explain the sort of experience that you're having of life right now and show you where God is in that experience. But that does not mean that you have to flip around until you find the one that strikes you or the one that resonates with, me, with you. If you do that, then you're sort of using the Psalms just to get that feel good, that pick me up, and not to actually encounter God. Even the Psalms that don't resonate with you in your immediate life have value. And here's why. It brings us to question number two. When you sit with a Psalm, has this experience been a part of my story? Question number two. Has this experience been a part of the broader story of my life? Have I been in a place before where it feels like in the language of Psalm 69, the waters have come up to my neck and I'm sunk in the pit? Or have you been so confident in God that you can say with the poet of Psalm 4, in peace I lie down and sleep, for it is God alone who makes me dwell in safety. This is a super important question because it helps us to remember, helps us to reflect on our story and where we've been. If any of you have read the Bible for any length of time, you'll know the admonition to remember, 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 remember. Well, why does it matter that we remember? Glad you asked. Psychologists have called humans storytelling animals. We're more than animals, but we're, we're not less than, than that. Our minds function in such a way that we turn everything into a story. So think about when you tell a story from your childhood, and as time goes on, it sort of gets more and more accurate as you sort of shed the fat, you remember more correctly, you hear some, your, your mom tell you a little bit about the story. Or consider the opposite of when you sort of buff up a story, you put some fat on it for entertainment's sake, you know, and you're like, ah, well, maybe that didn't happen exactly how that happened, but this will make the story more juicy or whatever. That's what humans do. We reassemble. We take these things from our lives. We reassemble them. We coagulate them. And then we, we make them storyized so that we can understand them ourselves and so that we can share them with other people. So if we let the Psalms remind us of, what, of where we've been able to be encouraged in our story, and we take a look back at a life that's full of mixture, it's been both good and it's been bad, then we can know that likely we'll go through those same seasons of mixture again. We'll run back into difficulty or suffering, even if we do everything, quote, right. And that's okay, because when we identify with a psalm of suffering, because our life has hit a season of hardship, we're always encouraged that God is there with us in every psalm. And when we hit a season of goodness, we know that, well, or we, rather when we're in that season of badness, we know that it'll come to an end, and that eventually we'll be back near the quiet stream, back in the green pasture. And instead of living in a suffering that paralyzes us, the Psalms can actually bring us out and into a place of encouragement and attentiveness and awareness of the presence of God with us, even in the difficulty. And it can give us an assurance that we will eventually move past that place as we look over the broader story of our life. So this is what the Psalms do. They act as a sort of spiritual, emotional thermometer. You can't read them without being confronted with where you're really at, how you really feel, and how you actually view God, if you're reading them openly and honestly. There is no comforting cliches or cognitive dissonances that can save you from the soul-piercing accuracy of a psalm that hits you just right. But they're not just thermometers for the spiritual life. They're also teachers. This is something that gets neglected, I feel like, a little bit, which leads us to our third question. What is this psalm teaching me? What is this psalm teaching me? The poetry of Psalms is devotional material. It's been said in the sermons past that they're part of a hymn book of ancient Israel. We don't often sit down with a hymn book and go, oh, what is this going to teach me? So it's devotional material that gets us in touch with God and ourselves, yes, but it's not just devotional material. The Psalms are also rich with theology and wisdom and guidance. They teach about God's character, about the origin of the world, about what humans are like, anthropology, the structure of the spiritual realm, and most importantly, about Jesus. If we ever start coming to Scripture, thinking that we know all the answers, then we've taken the first step towards spiritual death. 
And I don't mean that like your salvation is going to be revo- revoked, or you're going to be thrown into the fires of hell. Totally not what I mean. But when we start to lose our wonder at the Word of God, and we replace it with like this certainty, or even worse, like a flippancy when we come to the Scriptures, then we, we lose the ability to feel where the Spirit is stirring us. Now, that's true of all of Scripture, Psalms included. And so when we come to a psalm, we have to recognize that the poem itself wants to teach us. But how? Again, glad you asked. The psalms are poetry. How many of you read poetry on a weekly basis? Weekly basis. We've got one hand in here. Do you know how much of the Bible is poetry? 30% of the Bible is poetry. 33%, I think, to be more accurate. When we read poetry, we're reading a different thing, a different animal. We just went through a season, uh, season where we were preaching through James. When you read a New Testament letter, when you read the book of James, or when you read an epistle of Paul, those, those epistles are not, they're not like poetry. They present you with didactic ideas. Something like, because this, then this, therefore this. It looks a lot like this formula if we've got it up on the screen. I know we have it up on the screen. Just give it a second. A plus B equals C. That's what a New Testament letter does for you. That's what a didactic piece of literature does for you. It's logical. It works with our storytelling brain. It makes sense. It moves you forward. In a story, there's a plot. In a letter, there's a flow. When you read biblical poetry, and really poetry of any kind, it's a totally different vibe. It does a totally different thing. It wants to engage you in a completely different way. You're not presented with didactic ideas. You're given <clears throat> imaginative images. You're given images that hold something, that hold a principle or an idea or a thought. So instead of A plus B equals C, you're given something more like... Cue the slide. <laughs> You're given something more like water equals peace, wine equals life, staff equals peace again. Well, that's true, but there should have been something else there. Safety is what the staff represents, right? So we're presented with these images that hold for us ideas. They're not explained for us. We have to engage with poetry differently than we would engage with some other kind of genre. So while we want the Psalms to teach us, They won't teach us like a story will teach us or like a dissertation will teach us. They have to engage us at a deeper level, at a more abstract level, which can be scary. If you don't engage in the practice of engaging different types of literature, this can be difficult. (laughs) It looks like the majority of you need to start going and reading some Mary Oliver or, or, or something like that to get your mind into that place where you can hold an image and interpret it. We have to be open to the images that we're being given and then do our best to link those things to the principles, the ideas, and the realities of the things that are being spoken about in the poetry. So I'm going to take a moment and I'm going to read for us Psalm 23 all over again. And I want you to take note for yourself the images that come up and what their meanings might be all the way through the psalm. In your handout, in the insert, there's a small section uh, a couple of blanks where you can take notes. I would really encourage that. If, you, if any metaphors stick out to you, I want you to know that there's a practice called Lectio Divina where you, where you read a passage of Scripture and whatever sticks out to you, the Lord is attempting to speak something. So let me read this over us. Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. All right, did you guys get them? Did you let yourself see the images that are carrying for you, the ideas and the principles? All of these things are meant to bring you into a deeper space where you can recognize who God is, who you are, and what you are to do. 
All of that can only be facilitated by an encounter with God. It won't be done by checking a mental box or looking for something that's going to fill you up. It has to be come to with an attentiveness and humility and an expectancy that we will encounter God there. So what are the images of Psalm 23 inviting you into? What are they saying to you? If you had to leave here now and go and sit with Psalm 23 and you just knew, you expected God to speak with you, what would you hear? Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, you've given us this scripture that's so well known, possibly the most well known psalm in the whole book of Psalms. And so many of us, I'm sure, are glazing over when we have this psalm read to us or read over us. But even in this, you're wanting to teach us. You're wanting to speak to us. You're wanting to lead us. So I pray that each person would be able to latch on to one of those images that would speak to them exactly where they're at or remind them of a place that they've been in their story or in the next uh, moments of this, of this uh, service that they would just come to know you deeper through this psalm. And we pray these things in your name. Amen. I'd like to invite the band up.
Hey guys, we can all gather back up. I want to share some announce with, announcements with you. We don't have slides for them, but if you just watch the video, um, you'll have seen them. One, we have a block party coming up with Child Evangelism Fellowship. Uh, all the pictures and videos that you just saw on the screen were from our partnership with Child Evangelism Fellowship at First Baptist Gresham, which was super good. We had like over 30 kids, I think, participate. It was very fruitful. A bunch of different churches got together. Super fun. Uh, on the 17th of this month, uh, we will be doing our West End block party just right over in the parking lot. And then on the 18th of this month, we're doing a back to school Sunday um, where there will be special programming in the children's and the youth group. So if you know any kids, bring them through. Glad you're with us again. <laughs> Stand me
Thank you guys. That was fun. The, uh, we sung that song at summer camp, and the kids went wild. Everyone was in the front, and they were like, blessed be your night. It was fantastic. So welcome to church, everybody. We're not at summer camp. Um, Matt and Lisa are not here. I am here in lieu of them, so there is no kid church dismissal. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to read the scripture over us. You may be seated. And then we'll get into it. No kids dismissed. Second time through, if you were here for the first half, just let the words wash over you. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his namesake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and your love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Amen, Paul. Well, in Psalm 23, there are two main metaphors that act like sort of containers for the poem. Uh, They're the larger overarching images that sort of hold all of the smaller images together. And they're not hard to spot. You've probably spotted them as we've read through the scripture. Uh, They are shepherd and host. Let's say a quick word on both of them. First, The Lord is my shepherd. All over scripture, we see the image of shepherd as a protector and a provider. It's a very easy go-to image for the first century uh, people and before then because being a shepherd was quite ubiquitous. They would see it all over. And all of the major leaders in the Hebrew Bible either were actually shepherds or they held the symbolic role of a shepherd. Think of Moses, who after fleeing Egypt for a murder— that he committed. He spent 40 years in the desert being an actual shepherd. (laughs) I'm a shepherd over her. (laughs) Which ultimately led Moses to what? To be a shepherd over the people of Israel and to lead them out of Egypt. Or David, who was a shepherd, who was a shepherd boy in his father's house and who would have been passed over for the kingship Uh, by the prophet Samuel because he had these big, tall, strong brothers who looked more fit for kingship. But what did God do? He made David king. He made him a shepherd over his people. See, a shepherd is not a glorious position. I don't know if any of you have ever been near sheep, but they're quite smelly. I just want you to picture this. And, and over time, you had, to, you had to care for these guys, little guys like day to day. So over time, they would have their wool would grow so much that they'd very easily get stuck in thorns and brambles. And they would even, I'm sorry for this, but they would doo-doo on themselves. And it would get all over in their wool because they had so much. So imagine yourself. Do a little thought experiment with me. Imagine you're a shepherd in the Middle East. It's 103, like Arizona heat out. You've left your flock in the pasture, and you're making your way off to where you know one of your sheep that you neglected to shear, unfortunately, has got caught in thorns. You're sweating, and you've got to reach into this thorny bramble to cut loose your doo-doo-covered, overgrown sheep. It's 103 degrees out. Being a shepherd was not a glamorous position, even in the first century world. But when God wants a leader, who does he look for? Not the six foot five, 250 pounds lean, like rugby player or whatever they play in the Middle East. He looks for a person who's been faithful in the smallest, daily, dirty details of life. Someone who's cared for a creature that's weaker than them, less intelligent than them, and quite stubborn from what I hear about sheep. So two things from this point. Who do you look to as a leader around you, whether in the church or the culture at large, in your family? Is it the big guy? Is it the guy who like stands out and pushes obstacles out of his way and takes the reins? If it is, then I would just ask you to wonder, is that who God calls a leader? Is that the witness of scripture about who God calls and chooses to be a leader? And second, 
Consider in your own life where you're offered the invitation to be responsible for the daily, dirty, stubborn things of life. Every one of you has them. Do you ever think in those times that God is actually making you the man or the woman that he wants you to be? He's forming you more in his image by those times when you're, so to speak, cutting something out of the brambles than in the big, bright sections of your life. God is the shepherd. Consider that. He condescends to us. He comes down to us, his lower creatures. He guides us and cleans us, and he pulls us out of the thorns when we get caught in them. He works with our waywardness and our silliness and our downright foolishness, our lust and our malice and our anger, and he leads us. God is the shepherd. He's the shepherd. Now host, a word on the metaphor of host. He prepares a table in the presence of of my enemies. He prepares a table before me. That is the tagline that brings up the next sort of container, the next metaphor, and it's only two verses long in this psalm of God as a hospitable host. So I can't think of a better story to offer as an image of what a host does than the narrative that comes out of 2 Samuel 9. Um, that's sort of a foreshadowing of what the Last Supper will be. So Saul is dead in battle. He's fallen on his own sword. David has taken the position of a king in Israel and just been given a promise by God that his line will have an everlasting kingdom. David's feeling really good right now. He's got money. He's got wealth. He has everything. The kingdom is settled. He can throw parties and eat and drink and stroll the royal gardens all day. But watch what the scripture records instead of that, instead of all these parties. 2 Samuel chapter 9, verse 1. You don't have to flip there, but you're welcome to. It says, quote, this is David speaking. Is there anyone left in the house of Saul whom I can show kindness? And a man named Mephibosheth was brought to him who couldn't walk. Mephibosheth was the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, of Saul's house. And here's what David says when the man is brought to him. He says, quote, Do not be afraid, David said to him, for I will surely show you kindness for the sake of your father Jonathan. I will restore to you all the land that belonged to your grandfather Saul, and you will always eat at my table. By all accounts, a living member of Saul's house should have been a threat to David. But what does David do? Instead of like cutting loose ends, taking him out. He's a host to him. He's hospitable to an enemy and invites him into his own house. He cares for him and he gives him land and he uses his wealth, all that he has, to lift this person up and to show them the kindness of God. With all of our wealth in the modern Western world, as much as we don't like to think about it, have you guys heard the stats that like if you own a phone and a car, I think it is, then you're wealthier, you're in like the top 1% globally of leaders of wealth. And if you own a house, it's even crazier. Like I dream about owning a house. So we don't like to think that we're wealthy like David was, but we are. And what do we do with all of that wealth? Do we use it for our own safety and comfort? Do we use it on our own luxury? I remember when I was growing up, some of you guys know my story, um, and I tell it to the youth kids a lot, but I would have these friends, and they would be like, yeah, my parents aren't rich, like, whatever, and I'd go over to their house, and first of all, they owned their house, like their parents owned their house, they weren't renting it, and I'm already like, okay, whoa, and they would have like a full refrigerator, their mom would like come out, and like they'd set little snacks out, and make them lunch and everything, and they'd have like the newest TV and video game system, and I'm like, dude, what do you mean you're not rich? Because at my house... My parents were addicts, and so when I went home, there were times where literally, literally, you would, you would have zero dollars. Our family would have zero dollars. Those times were frequent. For most nights, my parents were, told us to fend for yourself. Do any of you know what that means? Where you just sort of rifle through the cupboards, and maybe you get like a frozen pizza, and you like undercook it accidentally so it's still doughy because you're like 12 years old, and you eat like some peanut butter on bread or something. Like that was my reality. And so when I was looking at these families, I was like, what do you mean you're not rich? And they're like, yeah, we're not rich. We just have like, you know, we own our house and we've got a 401k. Of course, everybody does. I've got $60,000 in savings. That is a storehouse of abundance. Some people, some people right now in our city, in my own experience of my life, I could not fathom living in that kind of, that kind of abundance. We have storehouses. God is the host, just like he's the shepherd. 
He's pouring out from his storehouses grace on grace for us. He set before us the way to be these things ourselves, and he has always called his people up and into these positions. He's given us the responsibility, the encouragement, and the way to be a shepherd to those around us, to be a host for our enemies, and he's given us the perfect image to be formed into, which is what Psalm 23 is really about. Do you guys know? Shout it out if you know what Psalm 23 is about. None of you have been to Sunday school? It's about Jesus. It's about Jesus. Psalm 23 is about Jesus. When Psalm 23 gets brought up, I feel like there's two general knee-jerk reactions. The first is, who died? Because Psalm 23 is a very common funeral reading, so that's totally fair. Or it's sort of a reading for, it's a, it's a go-to psalm for when I'm feeling like I'm in my darkest valley right now. And so you're like, you know where I'm going to go? Psalm 23. Easy peasy. Even people who are like super nominal Christians or people who don't read the Bible would be like, I'm going to go to Psalm 23. That's where I go. So those are the two knee-jerk reactions. Somebody died or I need a comforting psalm. Both of those responses are not bad. But I want all of us to have a different perspective. After we leave here today, when we talk about Psalm 23, I want what comes to mind not to be, is there a funeral, but Jesus. In Luke 24, Jesus tells his disciples, post-resurrection, he's already resurrected, they don't recognize him, he tells them that all of Scripture, from Moses to the Psalms, which is just a fancy way of saying all of the Old Testament, is about him and what he was destined to do, to live, to die, and to raise on the third day. It's a really curious thing, because when I read the Old Testament, I don't easily or automatically look and be like, oh yeah, there's Jesus right there in the uh, Levitical laws about not to boil a goat in its mother's milk. You don't often see it. Usually I have to pull up, even as a pastor, a commentary or a Bible project video to be able to see where exactly Jesus is intersecting the scripture. And it's made even more difficult by the fact that we've got a 2,000 plus year cultural gap. So the images that they use aren't the images that we use, and we struggle to figure out what exactly this thing means or what it meant to them. But when the New Testament authors wrote, they were steeped in that culture. And they always saw Jesus there in the Old Testament, like he said. But how did they see him? Where is he? How does he show up? And in particular, how does he show up in the Psalms? And more specifically, how does he show up in Psalm 23? The only way for us to see Jesus in the Scripture is to let the Scripture interpret itself. So y'all got to stick with me through a couple of long quotes and some technical stuff. Is that okay? Are you all with me? I need vocalization from you. Yes, yes, yes. All right, sweet. Heck yeah. Okay. David. David. Lots has been said about David already today. David was not just a king. He was also a prophet. And we credit him with writing a bunch of the Psalms. Therefore, much of, if not all of the Psalms, are prophetic. David was a prophet. David wrote many of the Psalms. The Psalms are prophetic. Even the writers of Scripture believed this much. And so that we can get an idea of what the New Testament authors thought, let me read for us a little passage from the book of Acts, chapter 2. You can flip there if you like, but nobody's holding a Bible. So I'll read the words, and they'll be up on the screen. Here, Peter is addressing. So Peter the Apostle is addressing the people of Jerusalem just after the Holy Spirit's descent on Pentecost. And Peter is describing, all, as Peter is describing, all of the things that happened to Jesus and proclaiming the gospel— he starts quoting from Scripture, and he, uh, he brings up Psalm 28, and he quotes David. He says this, quote, this is Peter speaking. David said, and then he quotes Psalm 28, I saw the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest in hope because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead. You will not let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life, You will fill me with joy in your presence. End quote on the psalm. And then Peter explains the quote. He interprets the psalm. And this is what he says. Quote, Fellow Israelites, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried, and his tomb is here with us to this day. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on the throne. Seeing what was to come, he spoke, that is, David spoke in the Psalms, of the resurrection of the Messiah, that he was not to be abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did his body see decay. 
God raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it. Exalted, exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. End quote. Acts 2, 29 through 33. That's Peter interpreting a psalm of David. So, David was a prophet. The apostle Peter believed that. Easy peasy. What did David see according to P Peter's interpretation? He saw the resurrection of the Messiah, the retrieval of Christ from the dead, and the exaltation of Christ to the Father. Some of you might know that uh, basically a third of the Apostles' Creed, an ancient Christian confession of the faith, is pulled from this passage right here about the death, resurrection, uh, the descent to the dead, and the ex exaltation of Christ. That's just a little tidbit for free. David said in his final prayer to God, when he's like on his deathbed in 2 Samuel, he says, quote, The Spirit of the Lord speaks through me. His words are on my tongue. Very interesting thing to say. After his whole life, he's about to die, and he says, The Spirit of the Lord speaks through me. His words are upon my tongue. I'm suggesting that we should take that seriously. Okay, you guys still with me? All the huge quotes are done. Easy, 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 chill. Okay, great. Now, how does that help us see Jesus today in Psalm 23? Last week, Matt preached from Psalm 22, another very famous psalm. Stick with me here. We're almost done. And on the cross, Jesus quotes the first verse of Psalm 23. We all know that. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But I want to ask you, is only the first verse of that psalm applicable to Jesus? Go ahead. So here, I would say no. It's not just, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The whole thing, if you go back and you sit with Psalm 22, it, it reads like Jesus is telling you the details of how the crucifixion day went down. If you haven't read it, go and read it today. And if you take a moment today, I want you to just sit with Psalm 22 and first read it like it's David speaking. And you're like, okay, yeah, sure, that could be it. And then read it again, but read it like it's Jesus speaking. Read it like it's Jesus speaking directly through the psalm. And then ask yourself, which one of these makes most, the most sense? Peter was suggesting that what David said about his body never being corrupted and his life being saved from the realm of the dead was not about David. David may have wrote it, but it was not about him. It was about Jesus. David prophesied, and he said, The Spirit of the Lord speaks through me. So when we read through Psalm 22 and recognize there the voice and life of Jesus, we then have to start asking ourselves, how many other psalms are also about Jesus? How many other psalms reveal Jesus' lived experience to us? My suggestion is that so many of them do, including Psalm 23. So while I was planning for this sermon, uh, I considered taking time to go line by line through the psalm and kind of dig out the metaphors and apply them to us. And my goal would have been to sort of encourage us, but I feel like so many of us know the language of Psalm 23 and are able to apply it to ourselves. And when you go out today, you're welcome to. Go sit and read the psalm. I've already encouraged you guys of this. Take time to let the Spirit speak to you. But right now, I want you to realize that the psalms are not about you. Here's a saying that's trustworthy and should be given full acceptance. The psalms are for you, but they are about Jesus. The psalms are for you, but they're about Jesus. They're for you because every psalm invites you to ask three questions when you come and sit down with them. First, is this my current experience of life in God? Does this psalm match with what I'm living right now? And is it encouraging me that someone else in the faith has gone through this? Second question, has this experience been a part of my story? It gives you the opportunity to look over the broad scope of your story and say, where do I land in this? Am I encouraged or am I suffering? And I know that eventually that time will round back out. And third, what is this psalm teaching me? And often it's about Jesus. Every poem in the book of Psalms is for you, for your edification, for your encouragement, and so that you can draw closer to Jesus. But they are about Jesus. They find their ultimate end in Jesus and in his life and death and resurrection. And when you begin to see that, when you believe it, then the encounter that we're looking for with God becomes so much easier. Arnobius the Younger, the Bishop of Gaul who lived in the 5th century, said of Psalm 23, 
we have in the previous psalm, Psalm 22, the tribulation of the passion. In this one, Psalm 23, let us receive the joy of the resurrection. What does he mean? What does he mean by that? He means that when Jesus says, the Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing, he's expressing full confidence in God. When we read, he restores or refreshes my soul, what we're reading is Christ's confidence in the resurrection. Even through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. If Jesus were speaking that, what could it mean? It would be the courage of Christ to travel through the realm of the dead, led by God to life, just as Peter said David had written about. Even if we were surrounded by enemies, even if he were surrounded by enemies, God would prepare him a table and anoint him with oil, literally making him the anointed one. That's what Christ means. The Christ is the anointed one. See, guys, it's Jesus in the Psalms. It's him that you come to meet with. It's Jesus that you'll encounter in them. And to me, I feel like this is the most powerful realization that we can have when we come to the Psalms. Because once we come to them and identify the Psalms with Jesus, then where we find our own life and experience revealed in them, it's not a book that we're drawing close to. It's Jesus. He has experienced that peace too. He has lived that joy. He has been on that mountaintop experience. And when you're in the darkest valley, he was there too. He's already walked through it. And guess what? He was brought to the other side. He went through death and resurrected to life. And you will too when you just give yourself over to him. Amen. Trust in him and walk with him Amen. all the days of your life. You bow your heads and pray with me. Holy Father, you have done miraculous things in your scripture. You've given us a way to see you that goes beyond this, what the scholars of this age write about. Our former Christian brothers and sisters thousands of years ago recognized you there in the Psalms, Lord Jesus. And we pray, I pray, that each other person would be able to go to them and see you there as well. That they would have that experience that I once had of the intimacy of knowing that your words are spoken on the page of Scripture that you've been through the same things that we've been through, that you went through the story of a life of mixture, both good and bad, and that you came out the other side by your trust in God. And we pray, Lord Jesus, that you would give us that same strength, that you would mold us into that same image of a person who's able to be like the Psalms are, like you are, Jesus. We pray that you'd do that quickly and over the entire course of our life. Pray these things in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit.
has come Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy From the ashes a new life is born Jesus is born today and this church family be with the uh, church families around the world that are also worshiping your name some of them not freely be with us today as we come from leave this place be with us help us to put on the armor and keep us safe protected in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 